Texas, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Next week marks the return of his talk show series, Star Talk, on the National Geographic Channel. We're glad you've joined us. Neil deGrasse Tyson coming up right now. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Please welcome Neil deGrasse Tyson back to this program. He joins us now to talk about the new season of his talk show, Star Talk, which premieres next month. Yeah, you're, you're obviously having fun doing this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just reaching out to pop culture and yeah, yeah. exploring all the ways that science matters to people who you otherwise cared about for some other reason. Yeah. Let me ask you to set your humility aside just for a second. Mm -hmm. and, and tell me, what is it about, what does it say about us as a society that a late night show about science on Nat Geo is actually working. Well, so I, it's, it's, it brings me such hope for, yeah. the, for the future <laughs> of, of civilization. Yeah. The, the, it, it, we didn't know this at the time until we looked back after the first season, and we said this is the first ever science talk show mm -hmm. on television. And I realized, well, maybe it could only be that because of the strong pop culture dimension. Mm -hmm. So. The main guests that I bring in, they're hewn from, you've heard of them. Mm -hmm. You know who they are. Even if you don't follow them, you know who they are. And my conversation, what we did was we inverted the model. So it would be like normally a journalist interviewing a scientist. Mm -hmm. But if you tune into that, you pretty much already know you like science. Mm -hmm. And we ask ourselves, how about the people who don't know they like science? Or better yet, the people who are pretty sure they don't like science. Mm -hmm. How would we ever get them to tune in? And we figured that we, the debate, is we have an, a, 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 an important pop culture person that you've heard of, that you care about, and then you follow them to the show, mm -hmm. and then you hear a conversation about science and all the ways that science technology has impacted that person's livelihood. And that's, that's where that comes from. And I have a co-host as a professional comedian, mm -hmm. not the one-liner comedian. Yeah. Like, have you heard the one about yeah, that? Yeah, I'm yeah. Told, there's a whole other category of comedians mm -hmm. who are perceptive observers of culture and social and cultural, uh, social cultural mores. And so they can interpret and contribute in ways that add a level of levity to the content. Yeah. And so, so we just have fun the whole hour, but at the end of the hour, you learn something. Yeah. Not that you are a bit of a stand-up comedian yourself. <laughs> No, you're, you're, you're a pretty funny guy. No, I think the universe is yeah. a hilarious place, yeah. that's all. And I'm just revealing that fact to whoever will listen. Yeah. No, I, I raise that seriously because there is something, again, set your modesty aside. Or, uh, you don't have to. I'll, 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 I'll just heap this praise on you. I'll, I'll heap it on you. I, I think anybody who's ever seen you on television, heard you on radio, seen you do a TED Talk, I mean, anything, you, all these things that you have done so remarkably well, it's impossible to listen to you and not get pulled in because you have figured out over the years of doing this, how to make science sexy, how to make it sexy, how to make it funny, how to make it interesting, how not to make it boring. How did you, like, seriously, how did you perfect that craft? Well, th thanks for noticing that. Yeah. And I, I don't know that I did any of that on purpose or with a plan. Yeah. What I would do is I'd be in the street or on an airplane typically, and people would see, this is early days mm -hmm. before I would get recognized, right. and people would notice I'd be studying some cosmic, mm -hmm thing and then they just start asking questions oh do you study the universe i say yes well tell me about the search for aliens or the big bang or the yeah. future of the universe or the, pa the past of the universe or are there multiple universes and black holes and wormholes and time travel and i would monitor the 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 the, the portfolio of questions that people harbored within them mm -hmm. and it was clear that they never had any other occasion to ask anybody mm -hmm. these questions. When you don't see Negro Afro, Afro <laughs> I can't even say it. Walking around every day. That's why you can't ask. Who you gonna ask? Hey, Peebo. Hey, Bubba. I mean, who you gonna ask the question about, about Pluto? Or so, I mean. so they're just sort of, they're, 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 they're contained within us all. Mm -hmm. And so I kept very good mental records 
of the kinds of questions people cared most about. Right. And I realized that I don't have to tell you what to be curious about. You already were. Yeah, yeah. And even if you forgot how to be curious, all we do is sort of fan the embers that may have gone dim over the years, yeah. get a flame going again, and all of a sudden, we can become kids again. Yeah. And say, is that how that works? There was a gravity wave moving across the universe, oh my gosh, and an asteroid took out the dinosaurs, oh my gosh, and we were just, our mammal ancestors were scurrying underfoot, and so, and, and, the, and the solar system is a shooting gallery, and so there's a lot of things about the universe that just feed our quest to understand who we are and what our place is in this universe. Right. And so over the years, I, I, I tuned my delivery of content to match what I already knew was burning inside of everyone. Yeah. And so to the extent that you observe that, that's the extent to which I have attempted it. Yeah. And thanks for noticing, because yeah. it means that it, it's, it's a real thing. Well, it, but you've also done, a, you and your team have done a brilliant job, though, also of figuring out interesting subject matter to apply science to. So like a year or two ago, and you, you know exactly what I'm talking about because I've forgotten the exact occasion, there was a big football game where the, where the, where the, where the ball, the kicker missed the field goal. Okay, so... You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I know and what you you're talking about. about the, okay, you talked about... Okay, take it away, take it away. You want me to do You want me to... You want to go there? No, I, I went online, and I, I went online. I was reading this online. I was fascinated People, by the way you explained this. Okay, so okay. here's what happened. Okay. Okay, I'll give you the whole story because we got time. You're going to hear the story. It's PBS. Okay. Take it away. <laughs> we, got, we got nothing but time. You here. got time. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, you know, I turn on the TV and there's some movie I want to watch in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, I don't feel like doing anything else. Let me just sit here and channel surf. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. You channel surf. Mm -hmm. Then I came upon a playoff football game that ended in a tie and they were going into a 15 minute overtime. So I said, all right, let me slip this in. Mm -hmm. all right, so I'm there, and I forgot who it was. It was the two teams. And there they go, and the, you know, the exchange possession the first couple of times, and then it becomes sudden, sudden death. Sudden death. All right. So then it's basically whoever makes the first field goal. That's right. So I'm watching, and, and you, they're making it like at 50, 50 yards. You don't get close enough to do that, mm -hmm. right? So one of the teams is attempting like a 50-yard field goal. And I'm watching it, and there it goes. And everybody's all tense. And, every, and there, the, there it goes. As the ball tumbles, it hits the left upright and then goes through for the win. And I said, wait a minute. Let me check the orientation of that stadium. So I went online and I looked at the orientation, looked at the latitude on Earth, and I said, mm -mm. <laughs> I said, this kick was aided by the rotation of the Earth. Because if you move, <laughs> if you are if you are airborne going north south on the Earth, uh -huh. your trajectory is altered. That football shifted a third of an inch to the right because of the Coriolis forces of Earth, the same forces that send cyclones, hurricanes into rotation, into, into counterclockwise rotation. It's the same phenomenon that would alter the path of a kicked ball, and so. So I tweeted that. Yeah. I just thought maybe people might want to know, and I just stumbled. You know, I'm just I'm just buying time for my movie, right? And so, but the the fun part about it is I don't have to explain football to you. Yeah. I don't have to explain the uprights mm -hmm. or field goal. Exactly. That's the pop culture scaffold that you unwittingly bring to that tweet, and now I clad that scaffold with actual science and caused a furor. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you did. You called a furor. No, not on purpose. I'm just saying, just, just this is the reality yeah. of life in this universe. We mm -hmm. are touched by science in so many ways that is otherwise under underappreciated. Yeah. And and with Star Talk, it's a it's a it's a conduit, I think, for people to gain access to the science that touches their lives. And by the way, I while I have particular expertise, astrophysics, mm -hmm. Star Talk. Is is we got this biology, chemistry, mm -hmm. and I bring in experts when that's needed and necessary to assist with these co this connectivity. Yeah. yeah, I love you for what you do so well. I'm still mad at you about Pluto. But that's another conversation. But I'm very impressed. You're wearing one of my ties. You got yeah, you see this? Yeah. Oh my, my gosh! My, Look uh, at you. Yeah, just for got the company tie on. Yeah, just to. Because I love you, and I love, I love your work. And but, just to be clear, we designed yeah, that yeah. so that Pluto is up inside the knot. Yeah. I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See that? I'm, I'm if you count the help, planets, I'm, you're not going to get nine. I'm trying to help out Neil. He's still bashing my favorite Pluto, <laughs> no. man. I tell you. God. Now it's like one of the big, big guys in the outer solar system. Yeah, okay. Okay? <laughs>
That was nice, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> now it's like a really big fish in yeah. another kind of pond. So the stuff right. you just talked about is the kind of stuff that fascinates us about the way science impacts mm -hmm. our lives. At this point in your life and your career, what kind of stuff is fascinating you? Well, so there's the intersection of the science and public interest. Mm -hmm. And so there's a list of things that will always titillate the public. And then there's stuff that just personally I'm interested mm -hmm. in. But the public likes to know if we discover a planet that looks like Earth. Mm -hmm. right, just you know, Recently, a planet was discovered, an Earth-like planet, was discovered around a star. That alone it, today is not new news. Mm -hmm. right? But this one is orbiting the closest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri. And there's the Alpha Centauri system is a multiple star system. You can see it from the southern hemisphere easily. It's a bright star system. But you go look at it with a telescope, it splits out into multiple stars. One of them, the nearest one, Proxima Centauri, has an Earth-like planet around it. So now, if you're going to make an inventory of planets you want to visit, that's probably going to be the highest one on the list. Mm -hmm. Problem is, spacecraft we have today, the fastest we've ever launched, if you put people on board that and aim it towards Proxima Centauri, mm -hmm. It would take, you know, 50,000 years <laughs> to, get to get to you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so okay. so yeah, here I am saying, it's the closest one. Yeah, yeah. But it would take basically, a, you know, a thousand generations. If, yeah. you, if you sent a generational ship, you'd have to load it with very fertile people. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they would have one generation after the next. You know, a thousand generations later, they would arrive. Who knows whether they would have evolved into some other kind of form of humans yeah. by then because they're, they're an isolated gene pool right. at that point so so that's an example yeah. of something that people totally care about and also there's the um we don't know what dark matter is and dark energy is and people like mysteries even if they don't fully comprehend it mm -hmm. they like knowing that scientists are staring dumbfounded into an abyss of ignorance and that's what we are now mm -hmm. dark matter is we don't know it's 85% of the gravity of the universe has no known origin. Mm -hmm. So we just call it like dark matter. We mm -hmm. don't even really know if it's matter. We just that's our, we can call it Fred mm -hmm. for all we yeah. fall that matters here, yeah. right? And dark energy is a pressure in the vacuum of the space of the universe that is forcing the universe to accelerate in its expansion against the wishes of gravity. Mm -hmm. We can measure that, but we don't know what's causing it or what it's made of. And if you add dark matter, dark, uh, dark, dark matter, dark energy together, it's 95%, 96% of everything that's driving the universe. Mm -hmm. So we, are, we have profound ignorance surrounding what has been very successfully accumulated knowledge over the centuries. You mentioned space travel, Neil. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask this question broad because I want to give you as big a palette as you want to paint on. I'm not, I'm asking, not asking a particular thing. Um, but we all saw the news some days ago, Elon Musk, SpaceX, the thing blew up uh, on the platform. Yeah, on the on the launch pad. On the yeah. launch pad. Yeah. Um, when you see stuff like that, um, just talk to me about about whether or not private is the way to go versus public, which is NASA. Um, does it does it does it scare you? Are we ready for that? Or is it, it? Are we even anywhere comfortable with putting people on the? I mean, just talk to me about that whole. Okay, it's a lot there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's I want to give big power. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so let's get to the exploded rocket okay. on the launch pad. Um, what one thing we've failed to do in the educational system is alert people that if you're doing what no one has done before, mm -hmm. stuff goes wrong. And in fact, if nothing ever goes wrong in what you're doing, if you make no mistakes in your job, in your in whatever task you've brought upon yourself, then you are not on the frontier. Simple. Mm -hmm. It, it's true in science, and I heard it applied to car racing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quote that I'm, I'm told, spoken by Mario Andretti. He said, if you are in complete control of your car, you're not in the race. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> there's something that yeah. you're just not completely in control of. I take that too. And only then can, and that's the same thing I'm describing mm -hmm. for when you are on the frontier. And SpaceX is on the frontier, not a space frontier where they're going farther mm -hmm. than NASA has gone. They're on another kind of a frontier, a frontier where they want to make access to space maximally affordable. So 
that means they have to design their rockets differently from how anybody else had done it before, mm -hmm. and they're going to be mistakes. So I see the exploded, uh, explosion on the launch pad, and I say, that is a, an occurrence that is rich with learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not just a spin, it's real. Yeah. And, and it's, yes, it's a spectacular explosion because the whole rocket is filled with fuel. But uh, it's typically one little thing that went wrong that they had not anticipated. They have to design it differently. Mm -hmm. Go back to the early days of NASA. This footage on YouTube. Yeah. Rockets blowing up all the time. Mm -hmm. Because no one had put rockets in space before. So now they're trying to do it in a whole new way. I'm, I'm going to expect that and more of it. Okay. So now, who's going to lead the frontier? Well, I, I take my cue from the history of civilization. All right? uh, and if something is expensive dangerous with uncertain return on your investment then governments do it first period yeah the first europeans to the new world was not the dutch east india trading company yeah it was spain <laughs> yeah. sending mm -hmm. columbus and columbus takes notes okay here's where the trade winds are and here's the friendlies and the hostels and the food or the no food or the weather conditions comes back now you can get investors and say okay took that long you found these things to trade with the here's the, the mitigate the risks of your health risks or hostile uh, other folks risks whatever are your risks now you can create a business model so uh, i would assert that the first people on mars are not going to be private enterprise because there's no, there's no real return on, there's no business model for it. You could do it, mm -hmm. but it would be like a vanity project. If Bill Gates got together with Elon Musk and shared their billions and said, let's put somebody on Mars, they could do it. But it's not a, it's not a business model. The investors, the board members, if it's a publicly traded company, mm -hmm. will ask, why are you doing this and how does that increase the return? We, business does not do that until they know there's a return on that investment. And so you'll always need NASA. But the moment NASA does something routinely, they should just pass it, yeah. pass it off. Right. To, to, so NASA had been going in a or, low Earth orbit, boldly going where hundreds have gone before. <laughs> We've been doing that for like 40 years. I'm yeah. thinking, okay, NASA, yeah. all right, NASA, I want you to take me to a new place, yeah. please. One of those is they we built a huge space station in orbit. That was a kind of an engineering right. frontier. But I'm a space guy. Take me to the next destination that's farther away than you've ever been before. Yeah. So, I, for my money, I would have had NASA seed the seed as in C E D E sure. seed access to low Earth orbit to corporate enterprises while they put their money on the uh, ever extended frontier. Let me do a one eighty, complete one eighty. Sure. That. So the flip side to everything you just said now is 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 the area where I live or have, have come to live, I think. I'm, I'm a new resident here, but I think I've come to live in this new space as I get older, where I have accepted the fact that part of being human means being willing to live with unanswered questions. Well, of course. Oh, my gosh. I wonder if I share that. But as a, oh. science, as a scientist, I don't get that you feel that way. Oh, no. Well, so, yeah. no, no, no. So, so that's a, that is a deep thought. And let me add some flesh to it. When you're a kid... Your parents have all the answers, whether or not they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're right all the time, too. <laughs> and they're right all the time. They have all the answers. <laughs> and you are full of questions. Exactly. And then there comes a time when you realize your parents don't have all the answers to the questions that you've posed. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you reach a point where you've posed questions where nobody has the answer. And this is a, this is a point of intellectual maturity that is terrifying. How could we not know the answer? How is that possible? What? Mm -hmm. How? And if you look through the history of unknowns in our culture, that is a fundamental role religion has played. Religion of all stripes. You go back to ancient Greece, we call it mythology, but it's really their religion, all right? You know, Zeus and, and Neptune, not Neptune, uh, Poseidon. And so there's a storm. I don't know anything about storms. I don't know anything about the Coriolis force or the, the, or the, the ocean atmosphere connection or moisture and, and relative humidity. I don't know anything about any of that yet. Poseidon is angry. A lightning bolt hit. Zeus is angry. Those are my explanations and I'm done. Now I don't have to live in some kind of profound state of ignorance about the world around me and its effect on my life. After death, I have no idea. Am I actually rotting in the ground? No, you are in some other place. You're on uh, Valhalla 
or heaven or whatever the religion provides for that belief system. You cannot become a scientist if you require that every question has an answer. Mm. Because it's the very questions that have no answers that attract you to the laboratory every single day. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be some kind of a shift. Part of it is you never really grew up from, as, from childhood because mm -hmm. you're always asking questions. <clears throat> but you've successfully made the transition to say, here's a question not only did my parents not know, nobody doesn't know. And I will then set up an entire lab just to find that answer. And when you do find that answer, that is one of the greatest moments that can happen in a scientist's life. Mm -hmm. What do you hope that viewers of Star Talk learn about themselves, which is to say humanity? Yeah, that's a great uh, a perceptive question. I think, I, let me answer it slightly differently, but that's the question that's inspiring this mm -hmm. response. I think most of us are trained in school to think of science as a subject over here. Oh, but I really care about history, so let me sidestep the science. I'll just learn history. I care about languages. I'm going to learn that science over there. Let me step around it, above it, beneath it, across it. Let me take as few science classes as I can because I don't really care about science. We're somehow allowed to think that way about science as a subject. That, that course, has a textbook. Mm -hmm. So uh, you either buy the textbook or you don't, or you take the class and sell it back. As long as you keep thinking of science as just a subject, you somehow are given carte blanche to say, I don't care about that subject. I care about these subjects. But science is everywhere. It is in your human physiology. It is in your health. It is in the very technology that drives what we today call civilization. So no one should ever be given the freedom to just step away from science. They need to recognize that science is infused in every single thing we do. And Star Talk is our attempt to display that fact without it sounding like, well, here's your science lesson for today. Now take your medicine and now you'll suffer, but you'll like me for it at the end. No, no. We are finding all the ways that you can celebrate the role of science in our lives. And it was working on the radio when we, mm -hmm. we, we were birthed by a grant from the National Science Foundation. Yep. They said, yes, we, we like that experiment. And then it jumped species to television. They got two Emmy nominations in its first two years. And then we're, we're jumping species again, seeing, seeing the book medium is a, th this book is a, it's a, uh, every page you turn to is like, yeah, that's a cool question. What, how did the show deal with that? And that's, well, that's a funny way to think about it. Well, that's, and so well, we just want to, plaster the universe with science. And you're doing it well. Um, Star Talk has its new season premiering next Monday night on Nat Geo, the National Geographic Channel.